Hey, welcome to the show. And uh, what I want to do is give you kind of the formal intro. So this is what I had. So one, I want to say a huge congratulations on like an incredible 2021 year, um, you know, fifth at the Olympic Games. Now, and, you know, and a lot of people, I mean, that is amazing, right? You're an Olympic finalist, fifth place. And uh, so to say congratulations is like, yeah, okay, right? Like, yeah, nice. Thank you. Fifth place. Yes, I'm very proud. But this is what I think to put in perspective that if people are going, wow, yeah, fifth, that's amazing. What's amazing is that it was fifth at the greatest shot put Olympics ever, right? Like, so your 20, 21, 41, right? That was your PR. So this, this is the things that I think are incredible are your PR going into this season, you, you PR'd your first meet of the year, hit the standard by a centimeter and then, right. And then you were, so you kind of knew your tickets punch. We'll get into that. You're representing Italy and all that interesting stuff. And this is a long congratulations, but (laughs) so, but the fact is you PR in the qualifying you PR in the final. So PB, right. Sometimes we interchange PR and PB in the U S. Um, so, so I think it's just, that's incredible that you, you know, you perform the rest of the seasons lights out. So you, you hadn't hit another PR until the qualifying of the Olympics. So you bring it at the best time, which, you know, I'm sure your coach is like going out of his mind too. I want to, I'm going to get to all that. I want to hear about all the stuff. Um, so, you know, you throw 21, 41 in the final and you literally that throw would have won like all kinds of Olympic games. Like you would have won 2000, you would have won 2004. Those are, those names are like great. Adam Nelson, you know, you've got, um, you know, John Godina in 96 didn't throw 21, 41. Like he's got multiple Olympic medals. You would have meddled in virtually, I think the only Olympics you didn't, wouldn't have meddled in was this one. And in uh, 1988, which was like all the freaks from back in the day, right? Timmerman and Gunther and Randy Barnes, right? So that was the second, that's when, you know, obviously, so that's my big introduction. So, So to say again, congratulations, congratulations on fifth place at the greatest Olympic shot put final in history it, it's just it's awesome so congratulations <laughs> thank you so much i think um it's nice to hear it uh, with uh, in in that much context i think you know i, I obviously understand it i'm a uh, i uh, am involved in the sport but i think for a lot of people that don't necessarily understand it it's nice to to put into context i feel uh, very proud um even though <laughs> even though it is uh, with regards to my own performance but i think you know i was understand all that went in there but it uh, it really you know, was a fairy tale in many aspects yeah um you know so i i like i said i have a ton of ton of questions um you know i i done some research on you you sound like a really cool young guy like you got it sounds really put together i want to get into that in a little bit we'll go through and i'll ask you about kind of you know, kind of on your personal interest side, you sound like you got a great positive mindset. It sounds like you're in, like you, it sounds like you have an interest in that kind of stuff, like, you know, positivity, uh, you know, just the, the, the psyche and the mind and different things like that. But looking at your situation, you're South African, uh, you know, born and raised, but I saw that your, your grandfather, right. Is, is an Italian and your mom has an Italian passport. And it sounded like you know, you have a sister and you guys had been working on like dual citizenship. It sounded like when you started as a kid, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so how do you, you know, looking at your progression too, and like you said, a fairy tale, you really are. Now, the thing that makes this, when I said all that stuff too, about the introduction and anybody watching, I've looked, you know, we, we have a post we're probably going to put on our Instagram today. And I think it's a post of you throwing and it's a post against, uh, of Jacko Gill. And we kind of do one of those, what's your, who's your favorite kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. And so we have this picture and I don't know in, in you, I swear to God, you look like you, you weigh like 240 pounds in this video. <laughs> and, and I'm like, you just told me earlier when, before we started that you were, you, you weigh 114 kilos. So you're right about 250 pounds, which is like unbelievable. Like pound for pound, you were the best guy at the games. I mean, 
pound for pound, right? Now you've got Krauser, Walsh. I mean, the four guys ahead of you, they're not just four guys. They're the they're like four of the greatest guys ever, right? Which makes this why this is the greatest Olympic shot put final in history. Um, and now you're going toe to toe with like Darlin Romani and he's a monster, right? Like Darlin's just jacked. Yeah. And, you know, and I've, and I, being an American, you know, I, I've, I've known, uh, you know, Joe Kovacs, his Art Venegas was his coach for a lot of years. That was my collegiate coach, um, had a big influence on me, Ryan Krauser, uh, you know, I've, 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 uh, spoken to him a few times, seen him at some key meets and different things. And he's huge too. Right. And he's bigger. Like I taken a picture with Ryan. I look like a, like a shrimp and I'm six, three and a half, you know, so I'm probably about your height. You're yeah. I'm an old skinny guy now. So I only weigh like, you know, a hundred kilos now or something, but I'm a young skinny guy. <laughs> <laughs> and you're so, so I, I, so I'm looking at your progression and kind of talking about how we get there. So we've got a couple of things I want to talk about. Ask you about the decision to compete for South Africa, because funny enough, an Italian teammate of yours, Nick Ponzio, I actually coached Nick Ponzio in high school. So when he was a high wow. school, he threw 21. Uh, I think he threw about 21, 15 with a 5.45 shot. So I started coaching him. He was throwing about, uh, 1830. And then after I'd been coaching him about nine weeks, he threw 21. Uh, so wow. he had a, he had a huge PR. So oh, I coached. That's I, huge, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So I, so funny enough, there's a little bit, I like kind of know, and I know how much did you get to know Nick? You, you guys travel as a delegation or was, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, I got to meet Nick uh, quite early on. We, we stayed at the uh, Tukorozawa university when we first mm. got there before we moved into the village. Um, so yeah, we were there for a few days with Nick, um, but we had all our separate rooms. And then when we actually moved into the village, I roomed with Nick for a bit. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I got to know him reasonably well in a, in a short space of time. But uh, yeah, that's 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 basically. But good guy, uh, great shot putter. Um, knew of him before, obviously coming over to Italy. And um, yeah, yeah nice, n- n- nice to have him there. I think uh, you know a, a rising tide raises all ships. Yeah, that's interesting. And now, now that said, um, you. Uh, you train with coach uh, Paolo DeSaglio, right? Um, again, that guy, he's, uh, you know, two-time Olympian, uh, right around a 70, I think he, right around a 70-foot PR, right? I think like 21, 23. 21, 23, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he, he, he had been coaching at Fabry, right? Leonardo mm-hmm. Fabry, did I say that right? Exactly. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Okay, good. Um, and so... You know, the interesting, like, I'm going to give it over to you because there was this decision. You're South African. You Again, you have this family connection. It sounds like a long process, like, and you eventually did this. And you made the decision to throw for Italy before you broke out, right? Like, I think yeah. you officially started representing Italy in 2020. And up to that point, you'd only had like a 19 meter PR. And not to say only, but, um, you know, the, the I think the level of men's shot put over the last four or five years has been incredible. You know, every, everything has gone up like on all levels. And so 19 meters a few years ago, like literally, you know, in 2019, right. You had 1909. So you'd barely scratched 19 meters. And, uh, and then you start, you, 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 in that process clearly became an Italian citizen. And then you found coach Saglio. I hopefully I'm saying that relatively correct. Um, good enough. Okay. And, uh, and that's an interesting thing. So I'm going to just let you kind of explain how you kind of, how, you know, how did you make that decision? Cause I'm sure that's always a tough call. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're gro- born and raised in one country and it sounds like you got the best of both worlds. Now it sounds like you get to go live in, in when the weather's good in both po- spots at this point. Um, and you really took off it. Did I get this right in 2019? You'd look like you only had about three competitions. Is that? No. So tw- 2019, I think I had a few more than three. It was, okay. around, I think it might've been, it might've been, you know, but, but maybe six, you know, okay. so not, not a huge, not a huge bunch, but definitely more than three. Okay. And then in 2020, uh, you become an Italian citizen and you start, looks like you're really con- hitting a lot of competitions over in Italy. And uh, so, yeah, so tell us a little about that 
I'll ask you about how you met, you know, your current coach and what you guys have done together is fantastic. And, uh, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. I'd love to, love Perfect. to hear it. Okay. Thank you. So I'll try, I'll try, uh, make this long story, a short story, but when it's, so I studied at university from 2014 to 2018, uh, graduated and sort of messed around with the shot put, but, uh, the university was very academic intensive and, uh, the way that sort of South Africa is set up, it's very difficult to, you know, have a good quality of life without a university education. Hmm. Um, it's not impossible, but it certainly makes it a little bit easier, I think, especially if you're going to go into the professions, accounting, medicine, engineering. Okay. So I went to university, um, dabbled in shot, but took it seriously. And um, I remember I had a, I think it was 20, 2016, I got a PR or PB of 1697. And um, that was, for, I was so happy with that. And I was super confident with 1697. You know, I had very little competition. There was no one really around at that stage doing anything bigger, yeah. uh, one under 23s. Um, and, you know, so I, when I look back now, I was unbelievably confident with 1697 um, than I sort of probably should have been. But <laughs> took, sort of ca carried that all the way to the end of university. And even in February 2019, that was my, that was my PB, is 1697. Right. Okay. And, uh I'd always agreed with my parents that I wanted to, you know, give shot put as a career a try. Um, and they sort of understood and agreed and were super supportive, but said, you know, get the education first. And then uh, the sort of gentleman's agreement with the both of them was that I'd have two years where they'd sort of financially support me, um, you know, with accommodation, the food, like the bare necessities, nothing extravagant. Right. And so when I, I went up to Johannesburg uh, to be coached by a coach, a South African coach, Pierre Blachnot up there. Okay. Um, in my opinion, was the best um, at the time and maybe still um, for, for my own personal character. So I went up there and after two months of being up there, he was diagnosed with uh, mouth cancer. Mm. Yeah, and I read that. Exactly. So he stopped coaching, uh, obviously, to focus on things far more important, which kind of left me a little bit stranded. And yeah. that was when I started uh, training with a guy named Orazio Cremona, who's also Italian, South African. Okay. And being in Joburg, I was in the process of already getting my Italian passport. We had tried because you have a birthright, um, obviously, at birth. But it was extremely complicated at the time for logistical reasons, financial reasons, and also just administration um, confusion to speak on the phone, try to speak to the right person, understand everything you had to submit. And it was a long process. And, you know, so it got to the point of like, you know, being very frustrated, we couldn't get our citizenship and, you know, with, with life just happening, we, we sort of couldn't get it when we wanted it. So we had said, you know, when I go up to Joburg and we have the, the consulate in the province, I can sort of manage everything. And so in doing, when I was up there, I started the paperwork and then in training with Orazio Cremona, he, he suggested to me, um, you know, as, uh, we were speaking, I said, I believe you're Italian. Why didn't you compete for Italy, et cetera, et cetera. And he gave me his reasons and, he, um, he actually recommended Paolo Del Solio uh, mm -hmm. the first time. That was the first time I'd heard of Paolo. Um, okay. I'm obviously a fan of shot put, but I really don't follow too much of uh, the history of shot put. I'm kind of like, and we'll get more into that, I'm sure, a bit later. But, you know, I'm more of a fan of the sport as a vehicle as opposed to, you know, just being sport cra uh, shot put crazy. Okay. I'm not particularly sentimental to the sport, um, which might disappoint a lot of people. But um, I still think there's a lot of value in using it the way that I do. And... Um, so anyway, so that's the sort of uh, the, the Italian part. Okay. And so he sort of kind of, we spoke a bit and he gave me a few pointers. And so I took his advice and, and, and got, finally got the passport after a lot of back and forths and uh, trouble. But then when, once I'd had the passport, um, in and around, before I moved to Joburg, my grandfather very recently was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. A huge uh, sort of early interest, someone that got me involved in sports. And he used to actually, he wasn't a man of many words. And I think that had a lot to do with the language barrier. And I'm slowly understanding that now, especially being in Italy and learning the language and understanding the guts, the courage, the, the ability to sit down and, and study. And... Uh, you know, yeah, like I say, he was, he used to come and support us and, and he was always sitting in the stands, never said a word, but he was there, you know, and that was something that, that I uh, take a lot from that, just that presence. And so when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and, you know, he kind of stopped recognizing me and, and my other, um, my sister and cousins and my coach was, <clears throat> the coach at the time was diagnosed with mouth cancer. I just left university. So I was in like a weird transitional phase in my life. 
And it was like a, co a culmination of many factors and, you know, just searching for meaning and, and trying to understand what am I going to do? I've got my interests, I've got my education, but I've got my passion and I've got my questions. And so, you know, that kind of all came to a point when I was thinking about doing something that was meaningful to me, because uh, I think it has to start there. And that was when I kind of like drew a lot of inspiration from my grandfather's personal story and leaving his family in, you know, going into a new land to try and uh, enrich himself, to give himself the, the, uh, the life he wanted, uh, taking on all the risks, the uncertainty, the, the challenges, uh, there's a lot I admire about him, and, and in a way, it was it was something that gave me meaning in imitating the reverse of what he's done, but okay. in doing that, sharing sharing a lot of the uh, challenges that he would have had, and in, in, in a way, sort of give me a taste of what he went through. Hmm. And yeah. it's, it's been it's been fascinating to be in Italy and to see so many of his characteristics that I thought were unique to him as an individual. But a lot of it has to do with the Italian culture, and then to see what was actually unique to him and um, it's, it's beautiful, in it, but it's, it's difficult. And uh, I, I often think about how difficult it must have been for him without the technology that we have now. Yeah, right. But, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I think a, a lot of people are quick to assume that it was a financial decision. And, you know, when I think a lot of people forget that when I went over, I was in no position to earn money. <laughs> Okay. And, uh, and, and I wasn't even aware of maybe the, the, the financial implications. I didn't know, you know, I was so out of touch with the, the South African setup, um, the support for the athletes. And I had absolutely no idea of what it was like in Italy. And so, you know, when I was reaching out to people, it was kind of in a way of just, first of all, looking for a coach, um, searching for a bit of meaning personally, mm -hmm. and um, imitating the, the reverse um, sort of trip of my grandfather. And uh, that, that's kind of the sort of the short version of why I decided to, to go and do that. And like you said, it's not an easy decision. Um, I often reflect on how beautiful it would be to wake up in the morning at a, ha at, a, at a house I've got a really close family you know with my parents or be close to my parents you know after a tough day of training come home share a dinner share a meal with them and you know reflect and be there for them they're not getting any younger I've got an 89 year old gran that's also you know quite an important part of my life and she's not getting any younger and you know spending eight months at a time away from the people that I love the most often has me weighing up a lot of the the um the meaning of how how important is this actually to me so right. there's been a few times i've thought of like you know is it worth it and and, and almost thinking not um and so I'm, I'm i'm happy to be here now and i'm i'm happy to finally um and this is not this is not before i did well this was even after the olympics you know i was having these thoughts my environment is so intense and so disciplined and um and, and non-diverse it's so one-tracked and i think that's been a lot of the reason for my success but it's been a lot of the reason for the um uh, the difficulty mm -hmm. and so um, I'm, I'm getting into a place now where i'm sort of finally being maybe a bit more uh, clear about what i want how i want it and, and so i think as i can be a bit more independent in italy learn a bit of the language have a bit more say in what i do when i do it i think that'll give me a bit more peace of mind but it certainly hasn't been easy and so you're living in italy uh, roughly about eight months out of the year now that's kind of what it totals up to. I have for the last two years. Um, okay. also, so when I eventually went over to Italy, I, uh, I was very fortunate enough to move in with my coach because what happened, I was there sort of seven days before the national lockdown. Oh, wow. And uh, my coach said to me, you, you said, you know, you're more than welcome to stay with me, but we understand, you know, these, this is back in the beginning when no one really knew what was happening. You know, if you'd like to go home and be with your family. Right. And uh, it was a tough decision, but I was like, I'm here. I've sacrificed so much to get this opportunity. So I was fortunate enough to move in with him. Yeah. And he's actually, he's got a, a shop with a circle on his property from the days he used to train in a beautiful um, hill. Um, he's got a bit of a uh, bit of land there that his oh, father awesome. sort of works and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And so, you know, once a day we were training, we're doing technique one day, weights the next circuit the following and we'd do that twice. And hmm. so it was very light training and that kind of took me from the 1909 um, to the sort of 90s and I, the slow progression into the end of that year, I think being 2070. And um, yeah, I, I owe my coach uh, a lot. Yeah, you know, I looked at that and uh, your previous, you know, I mean, honestly, it's really interesting. You, you've said, you said a word a few times and I caught it in some research I was doing on you and you said the word meeting. And, mm. and I think that's a really interesting thing because you you have a very insightful kind of uh you know inward looking view it seems like 
And it seems to me, uh, because your success is, is pretty off the charts. Like, I mean, if, if I had a guy come to me with a 55 foot PR, so roughly, you know, whatever, 1691. And now when you had that, was your thought, like, I want to try to go make an Olympic team. Was that really in your head? Definitely. Yeah, you I mean, know, it, it was, it was always the goal in the Olympics, you, you know, know, because, that. because in America, right. We we're, we're, te we're teaming with, you know, zillions of like 19 and 20. There's like the, the list USA is crazy, right. In the shot, like the depth of guys, we could probably put, you know, a dozen guys on Olympic teams all around the world. That would be, Easy. you know, it, it's incredible. Um, so if I had a guy come to me at, with, you know, a 55 foot PR saying, Hey, I want to try to make the Olympic team. I'd be kind of like, this guy's toweled and he's 20 some years old. He's hardly thrown like that's a, and I mean, it says a ton about mindset, right? Like you've got to be, Hey, I, I believe in myself and obviously you, you, you prove that. And so, you know, coach, uh, Paolo, I'll just call him Paolo. That's easier, right? Perfect. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, that's great. So, you know, he, he, he sees you coming in. So, okay, okay. But 19 meters at that point, I'd say, yeah, okay. 19 meter guy. That's it. And you had like 16 comps that year, I think, and 13 of them were all over your PR. So clearly it was a big breakout, right? I mean, and now all of a sudden 2070, it's like, yeah, this is like, you're, you're damn near to the standard. So it, it so how do you arrive at all that? Like you get there, you train, how do you go from, you know, you had a, and, and that's really amazing, right? I, I always think that's where, that's a, that's a great testament to your athletic ability. And it's a great testament to the coaching. Clearly it's always, I think that's a thing that this sport I see more in the U S than I see from international throwers, but I think you get a, a lot of guys and they start thinking, it's all, a, you know, it's an individual sport and they kind of forget like, yeah, but the coach is really a vital part of that process. Or, I mean, it really is. And, and everybody who's successful has great coaching and it's that combination of great athletic ability and great coaching. How do you guys, you know, you, you guys are training in his backyard basically, right? And you've got a whole training set up there. You do, you, you make that leap, you believe in yourself, you go, you, you, you know, I mean, that's a big decision to make and but you put yourself in a situation and it all happens which i think is a huge testament like i said to the fact that if you believe in something and you set out the actions to go achieve that and you know you've done it and uh so how does how do you you know you said again it kind of ties me back to the 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 mindset and and the meaning of it all um and this is still something you were like, you said, you use it as a vehicle, which I thought was really interesting. And it, to me, that says you have some good balance. Well, I think when you, you know, I've known some athletes who they get so obsessed about this and then it's like, it becomes not fun for them, right? Because they're, they're, they're working so hard and, and it's, and it's becoming mundane because this is a tough sport. This is a lot of work. You know, you're always working, you're throwing, throwing's hard training's hard, you know, it, and so to have that balance of fun, and it sounds like you do a lot of that. It sounds to me from what I've researched and talking to you in a short time that you have that good balance. So how does that kind of play into the training for you? And, and how do you feel that that's led to your kind of like success? I think a lot of my mindset, especially with um, having things outside of shot, but has sort of been birthed by the fact that it hasn't been balanced. Um, obviously I had a very, a very mixed sporting um, upbringing. South Africa's, mm -hmm. you know, great environment for outdoor activity, sport being really popular, especially amongst the schooling system. And you know, I did many sports. You know, I actually played baseball a lot when I was younger. I did water polo, hockey, cricket, soccer, rugby, and the list goes on. Obviously, athletics. Uh, there's so many sports that, that that I actually did do, and so I think that kind of like didn't make me idolize one very early on. And I remember actually even getting to high school, I think I was 14, and I wasn't even that really interested in athletics because there was no sort of movement behind it. We had no training. We kind of just twice a year had these competitions so they could choose the, the national team, et cetera, from a school uh, perspective. And I remember my dad saying to me, you know, just do it as a, as a, as a supplementary sport. You know, it can, it can give you a bit of, um, can give you a bit of status, can give you a bit of purpose. And, you know, it, it ties into with some of the other sports that you're doing. It's explosive. 
And so I kind of just listened to him and, and went along with it. And that was kind of where it was. And then it was only once I sort of fell in love with the individual self-mastery aspect of the sport that I kind of went, okay, I can see myself doing this. And that was, that was sort of where it came from. And then that was when I sort of honed in on it. University was in, in my first year university. I remember it was the first time being out of the, out of the house. I was staying by myself in the residence of the university in my own room. And it was the first time I kind of felt how meaningful it was to be in charge of your own time. And all of a sudden I was saying, wow, I, I can actually train three times a day. It just comes down to my discipline. And I remember at that point, I was waking up early. I was training in the morning going to university, training at lunch, finishing university and then throwing in the evening. So I was like training twice or three times a day, twice in the gym, once outside. And it is not the correct approach, but I was just so like happy to be in charge of my time and so excited to be moving and for the first time feeling fully responsible for my success. And that's what I love about shot put is, you know, I could not have had the extreme successful rise in any other sports apart from individual sports because in teams, there's kind of, you know, there's politics, there's team selection, there's, you know, coaches, favorites, et cetera, et cetera. Athletics, I mean, I'm sure there's a few other sports, but specifically the shot put for me was like, you, you throw the distance and they can't deny you, especially if you're doing it consistently. And that's also a big thing that I fell in love with and realizing, you know, having this, this point in the ground that kind of shows you how well you're doing in your sports. Um, and it's only recently I kind of learned that there's so much more to that marker than just your physical ability. There's so many other mental aspects. And I think, you know, my very intense environment from a training perspective and very non-diverse activities being in Italy uh, forced me to realize how important that stuff is. And I still don't have it 100% right and I'm constantly working on it. But um, having, I'm starting to realize the importance of having these other things um, in your life to, to sort of push you through and push you forward in the sport. Like I say, you know, having, a, having dinner with your family in the evenings, that, that's something that I feel could improve my, my performance. That's huge. Right. Um, Cause I don't, I, I don't like the, I don't like the discipline. I just, um, I lack the, uh, the sort of the other wholesome elements of, uh, of being a human being. And I think that's, you know, my sport's done really well, but if you're looking for sustainability, you've got to start feeding these other aspects of, yeah. uh, of the human, of the human interests. Okay. So, so you're somebody who obviously it sounds like you, you really liked the training process. So it was easy for you to start training frequently, right? If you don't like training, you're not going to train three times a day. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And um, so I think I, I, de I definitely enjoy the training process. Yeah. That's a, that's awesome. Now, um, when you, when you started working with Paolo, what was that? Like, so that was going to be uh, kind of one of the questions. Um, you know, like I said, it funny, he was fourth at the Olympics in 96, right? He was, an, so he's an Olympic finalist and, you know, he competed in a lot of, you know, European championships. I mean, he's got a ton of international throwing experience and I got to believe that's, that's a benefit, right? Cause he can, he can kind of help prepare you. Um, how did you guys, because when I, when I, you know, contacted you about setting up an interview, I'd asked if he could potentially join us. And you said, yeah. you know, how's your Italian? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I was exactly. like, not, not real good. How's yours? And you're like, oh, I'm not real good either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, so, you know, how is that coaching, you know, I, which I think says even more about how, how good of a coach he is that you guys have a language barrier on top of it and you guys have, have done all this. So tell me about like working with him, how, you know, how did that process go, especially since you guys had, you know, a language barrier and I'm sure that you're learning more Italian now and I'm sure that's getting better, but how was it initially and like, how is it now? And, 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 and how did you guys get through that? So I think, his English is actually is, is really good oh, okay. um, and, learn, and, and learning a second language. I can't I, I understand the sort of like anxiety and potential um, discomfort around having an interview, I think, in a second language. Uh, um, okay. So I think, I mean, we, we, we can speak clearly um, relatively easily. And uh, he um, what I like, he, he's very the way that he sees the sport is, is, is beautiful. So, sorry. So just to finish on the first point. So I was very fortunate that he, his English was really good. Okay. Um, and uh, it was just more, I think the, the interview environment and it's, it's like, you know, not understanding, etc. Okay. Gotcha. So I was very lucky from that point of view, but as a coach, you know, 
I've psychoanalyzed them quite a lot. I find the, 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 the sort of people's behavior and those sorts of things really interesting. And so I've done a, I observe and, um, and uh, yeah, just observe a lot. And I think, you know, he is a, he's a fantastic coach. He's a fantastic person. And I think what makes him unique is he's just got such an eye and such a passion for, for the sport, you know, he, um, the, the, there's a lot else that's important in his life, but I don't see him get as passionate about anything else um, so frequently as he does for shot put. And I think as as athletes, we're, we're extremely lucky to have people like that in the sport. And, you know, a lot of people comment on the fact that, you know, both mine and Leo's personal bests are further than his. And it's so easy to get caught up in the, you know, we're better than our coach. But I think he sacrificed so much of his athletic career experimenting so that we can start where he left off. Yeah. And I think that's, that's huge. Um, he made, he made all the mistakes for us. Now he, now he just tells us the blueprint, you know, and yeah. it's not, it's not even that easy. He's consistently giving us feedback on every throw, do this, do that. And his insight into the technique, yeah, I'm still, I'm still learning. I basically do what I'm told. I had to go from obviously a, uh, an athlete coach because I was kind of coaching myself to then just being an athlete. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the best things for me because, you know, it's when you're thinking and throwing, you're extremely slow. And so Mm -hmm. Paolo kind of took that away from me and he, he kind of gave me the opportunity to just feel through the movement. And he's like, I remember him saying to me, he's like, you throw, I'll coach. He said, and when you make a mistake, you come back, I'll correct you and you throw again and you just keep trying. And that's kind of given me a lot of sort of, freedom in the in, in the in the technique and i'm still learning the technique and i hope i never really get to a point where it's consistent um uh and i'm lying a little bit i do i would love it to be more <laughs> consistent yeah but i don't ever want to be understimulated by learning because you know there's there's things in training and i feel and i go wow that's that's beautiful you feel efficient you feel light you feel explosive mm-hmm. and that's that's really exciting and i don't ever want to lose those new feelings you know when you You'll go through like flip a, a month training camp and you feel like your body saw you getting there and you just nothing's clicking and then in the last week you know one cue you try it and you go wow and I, and i and i love that feeling and i when i look back so much of the olympics was a blur to me because i was just so overcome by pretty much everything there but uh, when i look back and i watch the videos now and i look at my technique it's so strange for me to see all the compliments i'm getting technically because i was never a technical thrower and it's, 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 uh, I think that's one of the proudest things for me is that people are complimenting me on something that was always a weakness of mine. And I think that's just testament to the process of just dedicating yourself tirelessly to something that uh, you enjoy or you, you know, you, you want to you want to do well at. And I think that for me has been one of the most rewarding things of, of what I'm doing. Very cool. Now you said, um, you know, creating new fields and uh, you talked about like you have those moments where like you're kind of struggling, everything's there and then something clicks. How do you, how, like, what's the longest period of time? Maybe you were in one of those points where it was like, it didn't feel real great. Where, where do you go mentally when you hit that point? Like you're going for a month and now you're starting to get a little frustrated. How, how long do you, can you stay in that point before you need to see that little, you know, that create that little feel, that little glimmer that kind of pushes you to the next point. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I feel like I was kind of there for the first 23 years of my life. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what I mean? I I never understood the technique. It always felt heavy. It always felt difficult. And only with Paolo um, did I feel that. And and only after trying to think of the first time I felt it, there was a competition in Vicenza and we went there two days before the competition just to feel the circle out. It's about 30 minutes from my coach's house. And uh, that's, that's one that I remember specifically. And, you know, I'd had in Italy, I probably had over a thousand throws in Italy. And, um, and I went there and I felt, and I went, wow, that's, that's what thrones. Like. And I remember my coach said, he said, welcome to shot put. That's <laughs> and, <funny>. uh, <laughs> you know, a beautiful little cheeky Italian wit coming through, but, but, and, and I felt and I went, wow. And that's the kind of the feeling I chase. And I've been in that search and I'm still in that search. Um, right. And I was very lucky in the Olympics uh, when we were in Tokorozawa, there was a week before we trained in Italy. Then we went through to Tokorozawa and um, we spent two weeks there or just under two weeks. 
And that was huge. I remember spending like hours a day, uh, I don't want to lie, but probably 90 minutes every other day visualizing and just going through and trying to feel. And then we'd, we'd train only once in the afternoon. And I remember going to training and remember thinking like, okay, I'm going to try this now. And it's like, it's not, it's very unsettling to have one of the biggest competitions in your life and you're still playing around with the, with, with the technique. And yeah. I think, you know, I was, when I think back, I mean, I think I went to the Diamond League in Doha after my 2111 qualification and, you know, competitions have always been a gamble. I've never been confident in my technique. Okay. And I remember going there and it was, you know, I had that beautiful big warm up, and then I just couldn't get it in the, in the competition. And I never understood the technique until literally two weeks before the Olympic Games. And uh, that was the first time I felt it. I understood it. And uh, it was it was great. And, and it kind of carried my season from the Olympics and, and after. Yeah. And, and to be Go sorry, ahead, yeah. just to finish off, just to finish off there, you know, it's like I feel like you lose it quite quickly because I'm still back in that same, in that same space. I've got a better understanding. I've felt the correct model and, you know, you're searching to recreate it and improve on it. And so that's what I enjoy. It's kind of like, I, I don't just want to have it. I, I, if I could just go every day to training and feel that I'd get bored so quickly, I would have already stopped. So that's what I kind of enjoy about it. That's very cool. Now, you know, what did, uh, it, sorry, it's just kind of stimming some thoughts. So as the coach, right. Mm -hmm. I think I've run into that with, a number of athletes. And I find that here with athletes, uh, in, in the States, my younger athletes will, I think that's the difference I've found. And I think that's what, uh, where I'm going with this is that it, it, an athlete, your age, you're 20, you're 25 at the games, right. And you have the trust, right. Like to say, okay, we'll play the, with this tweak. I have, uh, I have one of my throwers. He's a 65 meter discus thrower. I, you know, started training him when he had, you know, he was pretty much averaging about, he was kind of like in your situation, he had thrown 58 meters one time, um, never made it to like the NCAA championships here in the States, but, you know, had, but was averaging about 55, 56 meters in the discus he pretty much always would trust me. So even when we make a little tweak, it's like, you just got to trust me Tw tweak this, tweak that he did that. So, you know, we started coaching him 14 by 18. He had thrown, you know, 65 meters, um, multiple U S championships and different things like that. I have found, however, other athletes with older athletes, I find that that seems to be a little bit more of the, the exception rather than the rule that most older athletes freak out, don't trust the tweaks. Whereas I find with my younger athletes is why I've had a lot of success with them. They're just like, okay, I trust you. And then we can make those tweaks last minute. This is a long way of setting up. You, you make tweaks literally a couple of weeks before the Olympic games. That's um, that says a lot about the trust between you and your coach. And then clearly the rest of the season was like, I mean, you P, you, your, your PR going into games was 21-11. Then you go 21-25 to PR in the qualifying, 21-41 in the final, 21-20 after that, 21-32, 20, you know, then 21-63. So you're just really consistent. And then you, you have what would you would consider maybe a down meet, right? You went to Switzerland through 2085. <laughs> and that, you know, it's perspective. Like, oh, I've been, you know, like, your bad meet now is 2085 and then you finish up with 2166. Right. And you, and so how do you get to that point where you trust that tweak two weeks out of the Olympics and it just totally works? You obviously have to, like you say, trust with your, your coach is a big thing. And I think my, my biggest disadvantage became my biggest advantage and not having uh, done really well kind of gave me the opportunity to go to my coach and say, you know, save me, <laughs> you know, I like, I'm literally putty in your hands. I've got no idea. And uh, I think it, it, it's that whole like lifelong learning principle and, you know, just being able to be in a space knowing you don't know what you're doing and just trusting someone, you know, it, it's hard not to trust someone who's come forth at the Olympics um, and someone who's throwing 21, 23. And, you know, when I came as a 19.09 meter thrower, uh, I realized I had so much to work on. Like I said, I was never complimented on technique, uh, quite the opposite, in fact, you know. And so when someone is so confident in a model, you kind of think like, well, I have to trust it. And it was also, it, it wasn't so much that my coach was making tweaks. 
he was saying the same things. I was just, un- I was just understanding what he yeah, was, right. what, he, what he meant the whole time. Yeah, and yeah. so like, I've come back to him and he said this cue to me that he's been saying to me for six months. And I repeat it back to him with excitement because I felt it. And so right. that's, I think that's the, mo- that's the interesting part. It wasn't so much as he was saying different things. It was just that I was giving myself the freedom to, uh, or permission to do them. And I think that it is difficult because you get so confident in the model and I still do it today. You get so confident in the model that you think your existing model is the correct feeling. And so you have to almost be stupid enough to look stupid in trying something different. And when you do, and it comes off right, you think, wow, especially what I've learned now in the, in the rotational shot put is that is being relaxed. And it's so difficult to be relaxed in the correct time. Cause like you say, it's 1.4 seconds and you've got to be, um, your timing has to be perfect, you know, because yeah. a fraction of a second changes torsion by two degrees and two degrees is huge in, yeah. in, in meters. And, uh, and so I think that that's, that's, kind of you know I, I approach i remember in the olympics in the qualification i remember walking into the circle smiling and just thinking to myself play 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 and um it's the whole concept of going in there and just being like react don't predict and it was just getting in there and, and trying and trying to feel feeling my feet hitting the floor and um i've been trying to get back into that mindset now in preparation for this for this season and it's not as easy as i found it at that time and so you kind of just go through these peaks and troughs and um that's kind of what I'm learning to not necessarily enjoy, but surrender to, because I think, you know, there's just so much. And when I look back at my season and stuff that I've had, I just think that in a weird way, there's just been this divine, uh, this divine um, intervention. And I'm not extremely uh, or particularly religious, but there's, but there's, 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 there's an eerie divine intervention into, into my my story, you know, I could speak a, a lot of, of, of some of the factors, but, you know, you just mentioned the 13 PRs in the first year, then, yep. you know, then to, to, to get the Olympic qualifier by one centimeter, not throw kind of near that, I threw one in, in the bottom of 21.05, but that mm-hmm. was one throw, not throw near that until the Olympic qualification, which is like the most high pressure situation, Yeah. throw 21.25, then go into the final, and like, I'd love to take the credit for that, but you know, so much of it just becomes uh, subconscious and you, you kind of just have to respond to, to the environment you're in. And I think that, you know, being like a child, being childlike and just playing and realizing, you know, you aren't that important and just have fun and capitalize on the opportunity it gives you permission to, uh, to relax. And that's kind of how I felt in those, in, in those environments. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, like I said, I'm a, uh, I like to, uh, I, I love throwing, you know, I love, I love to coach it. There's just something about the time of the year, the weather, you know, you're out the grass. It's just like, I, I just take it all in having fun. Um, definitely because has worked out really well for you. <laughs> so, um, so let's do this. Um, obviously uh, I could probably ask you a million questions about Paulo. And, and again, as a, as a coach, it's really cool. And it kind of lines up with a lot of the stuff that I think, you know, it's that comfort factor, the trust factor. And like you said, you know, you got to go in. I always tell athletes, you know, every year I got to prep athletes for, you know, big meets and different things like that. And I was like, well, what's the difference between this national meet and that meet, you know, at the beginning of the season that was low key and didn't matter. And it's like, at the end of the day, there's no difference. It's the same circle. It's the same shot it's the same thing. You're just changing the dynamic in your head. So if you go out and treat it like you would any other throw, you should perform well, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but my, sorry, just to interject there, but my only criticism of that is that, um, it's not so much the indifference, but, but correctly using that energy. And so it's like, you know, if it, if it was just like any other competition, you can't use the Olympic games to your advantage. And I think that is, that, that is the, that is a concept that I'm still experimenting with. I, you know, the Diamond League final, uh, you got this guy from the middle of nowhere in the Diamond League final throwing against guys two years ago, I was watching for technique advice um, and I'm throwing amongst them in this like weird uh, performance type environment for the shot put. And it's weird for me to experience all these things for the first time because 
you know, I never had uh, any athletic success early on. I never had any athletic success, you know, university, etc. And so now all of a sudden you're thrust into this environment and um, it's weird. And then not only do you have to uh, compete but you have to try and perform right and i think th that's what i enjoy the most i don't know if my sort of like indifference and i don't know indifference is too strong of a word because i am i enjoy the sh i enjoy shot put but it's almost like the fact that i don't i've got so many other areas of interest in life kind of makes shot put not become a big thing it's like important enough for me to uh, dedicate such a big percentage of my life towards trying to uh, uh, perfect or master but it's not big enough you know, I could walk away from the sport tomorrow and just still be so blessed and so um, fortunate with all that I have. And so I think that kind of that kind of gives me the confidence to be like, you've got nothing to lose, you you know. Um, and I and I remind myself of that of very often because um, there's a lot of situations where you kind of just feel overwhelmed and you kind of just feel like, why am I doing this? Why am I spending so long away? And um, when you remind yourself of those things, you know, you can walk away at any point. You're always able to choose what you want to do. And um, that gives me a lot of confidence and I think what would normally be perceived as high pressure situations because of, um, you know, the fact that there are just so many options and, and I'm just so uh, passionate about so many areas of life. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's a good, healthy balance. And just kind of to say too, what you're saying when I was, you know, and I agree with you, that was a good point. You want to leverage that big comp, right? Exactly. Because it's, it's. It, 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 and again, kind of elaborate on even what I was saying too, because that was a good counterpoint, right? It, it, you got to leverage it. And I always say the adrenaline in that situation is going to be up no matter what, it's enough. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so that's where I mean by like, do what you do, right? It, and, and then it's like, and let the adrenaline do the work, right? And that's, and it sounds like you obviously leverage that uh, extremely well. So let's do this. Um, I'm going to shift gears. And uh, like I said, when I did my research on you and, and different things, I really loved what I kind of like found out about you. you you're, I like your, your, your mindset and you kind of have like almost like a young philosophical, like you're a young guy with a mature philosophical outlook. I, I think that's really cool. So this is, you know, the world record holder, the greatest guy ever. So that's a cool thing, right? I mean, I geek out on this too. Every, when I get to see Krauser, I mean, he's like by far, not just like he set the world record and which I said was always about Krauser was yes, it solidifies that he is the absolute greatest ever, but his number and volume of throws over like 22 and 2250, he just like crushes everybody historically. Like you can combine all of these great throwers the amount of throws and they don't add up to what he's done. So he's, he's really is just absolutely amazing. So Agreed. here's this six, seven, 320 pound guy who moves like, you know, like a, like a ballerina, the guy's incredible. And then here's Zane Weir at six, three, a hundred. And what were you, uh, were you 114 kilos at the games as well? No, I was 112 with the game. So, oh, so you were lighter. I mean, more or less, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I mean, it's it's pretty incredible. Now, to put it in perspective, too, like I was talking about how how impressive, you know, your, your results are, you threw further than Tom Walsh threw in Rio. Like, Tom Walsh only threw 2138 and got a bronze, right? You threw 2141 four years later. Those three guys all threw essentially a meter further. It's, it's absolutely yeah. insane, <laughs> insane, right? The, the, so uh talk about your technique and how a guy that weighs you know 248 pounds is in the olympic final you're the you're the lightest guy in the olympic final i know that without even having to look anything up right sure <laughs> so um so talk about like I, I i see you know and this is kind of similar to some of the stuff i teach you look like you have a, a more active um uh you know, you're, you're, you're consciously looking like you're trying to open the, the left arm more aggressively, but in a controlled way, I always say you open the arm, not the chest, right? Because if you open the chest, yeah. you're going to fall into the throw. So you're creating mm. this sequence, obviously between the lower body and the upper body. We take this and we put it into the six pillars. Funny enough, I told you I train mechanics. And then you'd said something earlier, you got to react. And that's what I teach my throwers. When we throw, we react. We don't think 
we react, yeah. right? We do drills and we do progressions and we figure out mechanics and then we react. So how you, when you do your offset, tell me at any point where you want me to set, like how, and, and again, depending on how much you want to give away or how much insight you want to, you know, I know. So um, the, the, the left arm action, like Krauser, you know, you see what I would say is, He's a ch more chest over arm, shoulder, chest connected, long path. Yeah. And whereas to me, you look like you have a little bit more active, right? You're, you're not as big as him. So speed start to finish. That was something I had talked to Joe Kovacs about a couple of years ago. He said, Ryan's so much taller than me. I've got to be fast, right? I, I've got to use my speed. And he's a freak, like, joe's like sub superhuman strength levels on top of it right yeah, so exactly. so with you with the left i notice how it it, it it's kind of looks to me like it's an active left side upper body to to kind of i call it pulling yourself kind of you open it and pull yourself into the throw and then at what point like and it looks like you consciously obviously try to stop the arm here so that you can wrap your body and kind of snap it into the power position. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. So, so, yeah. So I, um, when I, when I think, I think heavily coming out the back, I, I don't even think about the arm. I think about the, uh, the left leg. Okay. Um, I want to, I'm basically just waiting until my toes are kind of pointing the direction that I want to throw. And okay. that's for me, that's the hardest part of throwing is waiting for that, for that left leg. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to completely turn, you know, um, right. uh, criticism of my own technique is that you can see the angle of my, from my hips through my shoulders in comparison to Ryan, I lean a hell of a lot out the circle yeah. uh, towards into the circle, which uh, is not good for me because that takes the shot ball off the axis. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that kind of makes the 7.2 kg a little heavier when it's, when it's not above your, your hips, you know? Right. Um, I'm very lucky. I think for whatever reason, I haven't worked it out. I don't know why uh, I've got a few theories, but I'm very lucky that I'm explosive. So I get under it quite quickly. Uh, and I think that is something I like to work more on is just keeping the shoulders a little bit more back. You can see Ryan's uh, heel is uh, infamously low and uh, right. too bad actually in this one, but what that allows you to do then is it takes your center of gravity more out the back of the circle it gives you a wider whip around mm -hmm. and that's basically what you're looking for you want your right foot as far away from you as possible because that's the central fugal force that kind right. of generates and um i don't think about anything else after the left foot hits the ground apart from waiting for it to hit the ground again and then the rest kind of just takes care of itself it's like autopilot right um so my only my only sensations I kind of focus on is the left out the back and the left in the front and then okay. everything else kind of you know <laughs> um, just bleeds into each other. Very um, nice. Yeah, you know I call this so my my system we call this you know your wind up I call it pillar one and there's a lot of important okay. variables and in the start you know and then this is what I would call the hinge, the hinge is the, the left side. We refer to the ankle and the knee and the hip. And I coach my throwers. It's a, it moves like three hinges on a door. They move in unison. And that's yeah. the axis that sets up the, the throw, the upper body is going to follow. Um, mm. and so for you, how much do you focus on like with your setup? How much of this is, did you guys work on? None. None. So to be honest, it was kind of like, you know, I did that because it's when I was younger, it's what I saw the other guys do. Okay. And, um, you know, now it's almost just, it's, it's almost habit. It's not even uh, necessarily conscious. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's very, you know, I kind of do it just to get a bit more, you know, I, mean, I, I almost think when I think about it now, you know, I kind of, instead of taking the weight off the leg, I kind of might want to keep the weight on the left, but, but take it further from a, a rotational position okay um, whereas a, you know because i think for me especially not having too many throws with a correct technique you don't want to have too much variability uh, with your weight off that left leg you kind of want to keep that left leg you know under your body the whole time right um uh, so that's that's the other thing because i battle quite a bit with that that um you know those three are supposed to hinge together but my um, my hip often sinks back down mm -hmm. and yeah. um that that kind of gives me a problem so I 
yeah, like I say, I wait for that left to go. I've tried to focus a lot on the dorsiflexion of my of my right of my right leg, which is harder to do than um, one would think. Okay. Especially yeah. for me, but that 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 helps quite a bit with me. Okay. And uh, it just gives me such a beautiful wrap in the end. And I don't think about stopping that left arm. It kind of just happens because I know what it feels like to be in a good position at the end. Mm-hmm. And that's what I love about feeling as opposed to thinking about it. There's just too much to think about in that short space of time, as you said. And so I think that um, knowing what it feels like to be in the right position, you kind of just like you wait for that and then right. you throw. You don't, you don't worry about um, wrapping, re-wrapping. I've heard all these terms when I was sort of kind of figuring out in the beginning, but um, at, at the moment, I'm not focusing much on rep and whatnot at all. Okay. It's more just what I'm doing out the back. So you're just, again, very, you're very reactive. I think so. Yeah. Um, which has pros like, and cons. <laughs> it, it does. Right. Mm. But, um, and ultimately, you know, I've been, um, I, you know, I, I, I coach, I have a small club with developing athletes. So I have athletes that are new and you're developing athletic ability and fitness levels and they're really raw. And then I've had those young athletes that are, you know, they're, I've had these kids that are, you know, six foot three. So was that one, 191 centimeters? They weigh, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know what they're 130 to 140 kilos as high school kids and you know you know and so i have i've had a couple of kids that are 22 meter throwers with the 5.45 right you know so yeah um so to even to throw 22 meters even with a 5.45 you got to be doing a lot of things right and these kids are just they just pick up things so much easier. So it's a testament. Obviously, you're not going to be fifth at the Olympics and the best Olympics ever if you're not <laughs> if if you're not a an exceptionally talented athlete, right? That that's going to sure. be. Um, so that's interesting. So um, I, I I like it. So because you can you know so you you'd agree right here a little too far forward, correct? Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. So, so that being said, what, what other, is there anything else you would, you would like to point out about your position versus like, do you think, you know, cause Walsh has once you, you look at Walsh and Krauser, they're kind of about the same Walsh has the, the sweep leg incredibly wide. Right. Yes. So he really creates that extra speed as he, as he transitions from here to here, right. That wide leg exactly. really going to whip you into position Yep. And then, and then very similar to Walsh, this is where I would say like the left arm, I always, we coach to take it out and you, you have that great reaction of this, this path, which I think really allows you to finish. I mean, that's a great finish, right? You're Thank squared you. up shoulders, hips through, and you're just striking the crap out of the shot, which is how you throw 70 plus feet weighing 148 pounds <laughs> or 248 pounds. So, exactly. It'd be even more impressive if you weighed one in 48. <laughs> so, um, so it, is there any other points? Like as you come through the finish, I love that like the shoulders are square, the block arm stop, the hips through. You're a little off the ground, like whereas you can see Krauser maintains ground contact a little longer. Are, is this something that you're, you think you consciously do or is this something you want to do you want to try to keep yourself on the ground a little bit more through the finish no so it's not something i consciously do i um it's kind of just sort of all caught up in um how do you say in in, you know when when i get into that good position i have to just give everything and i kind of just come up off the ground which i think definitely works in my favor because it it makes you know my 190 centimeter height uh Hmm maybe the equivalent of a 196 centimeter thrower that doesn't come up as high, you know? Right. Um, Because my release height is probably the same. It'd be interesting to see what that release height actually was between me and Krauser, if uh, how significant the difference is, because he's considerably taller than me. Right. But, um, you know, I I do come up four or five centimeters, I think higher up off the ground. Um, And that's, I'm not not even sure if that's a good or bad thing. Um, I think it kind of helps because, you know, I'm getting everything through, but, if I were to think about it technically, you know, you kind of want your, you want to be on the ground while the ball's still in your hand. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I try to kind of just throw what, what, what feels good. And it's difficult because you can get caught up in the sort of nitty gritty of things. Um, yeah. And 
it's difficult because there's so much in the rotational technique to have a look at. And, and that's what I love and kind of hate about it. But um, that's why I focus so much on the feeling because it's like, you know when something feels sweet and of course you can make adjustments, et cetera. But um, at this point, it feels really good at finish. And I kind of, yeah. um, there, there's a lot more that I really want to focus on um, in the, out the back of the circle that I think will help in, in this right. front position. Yeah, that no, that's uh, I would I would uh, I would agree. It looks um, a lot of good stuff, and that yeah, I mean I I love how you're like like I said, squared up, the block, the hip through. I mean that's a great position. Clearly, Thank good enough, no. good, <laughs> good enough, good enough for for a couple of personal bests, right? Exactly. <laughs> at the at the time, you know, I know you went better oh. after that. No, of course, but it's still, I think, still proud to in that in that setting. Um, yeah, you know, it still means so much. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, training. You kind of covered some of the training, but generally, you know, what's the you guys obviously do you attribute the success towards the end of the season? Um, was it, you know, part of my job as a coach is always, and I've had a lot of good luck with that. You know, you set a plan this is when you're trying to throw far. I kind of do block periods, you know, where it's like, I'm trying to hit multiple peaks. It's not just yeah. the old school linear thing. So how does your year look? And then of course you peaked at the games, you know, and, and again, I want to say you were fifth in qualifying and fifth in the final. So, okay. you know, you brought it, you, you had, I think like, you know, it's a pressure environment. You open up with a 2084, the second round, you hit the you know, your PR at the time is 2011. So how is that, you know, when you go in knowing, well, my PR is only 2011, the auto queue is 20, 21, 21. And you yeah. go 21, 25, you're like, sweet, I'm in. And I'm going to come back the next day. How, how was, you know, how did that feel? Like you came in when you hit the 2084, you're like, yeah, I feel good today. Was that like? Um, when I hit 2084, I kind of went like, wow, that was easy. And so then I was like, this could be fun. Um, and I knew, to, I, I, well, I thought to myself, I actually don't know the statistics, but I was like, 284 is not enough. Um, and I, I always said to myself, I don't actually necessarily, I'm not too concerned about how I, how I do in the Olympics from a position perspective. I just kind of want a PR. And so, you know, when I hit 21, 25, I was, I was so happy. I don't, I didn't even process that that was an automatic qualification. I completely forgot the numbers of, I was super happy. And I remember asking the South African guy, their car, I said, what's the, what is, cause I saw it hit the white line. And I didn't know if it was 21, 30. And I, you know, so much of that qualification is a, is a blur. And mm. so um, I just remember feeling super happy and just feeling like, wow, you know, uh, that, that was kind of, uh, I don't want to lie to you, but uh, the emotion around that, the 21-25 in the qualification um, was, and coming fifth overall was almost more um, emotive than coming fifth overall. The coming fifth overall in the final was fantastic. You know, PRE and throwing 21-41 was amazing. Um, but the emotion and the sort of, I was even, I was surprised from, you know, doing that, but also not surprised. It's difficult to explain, but it was just the emotion from going from sort of, not expecting too much to then being there going, wow, you know, I just came fifth in the qualification. That's, that's huge. Yeah. it's um, massive. And, then to, and, and then to do it, you know, in the final as well, it was of course the cherry on top, but just, I remember coming back to my phone and just seeing uh, my parents, <laughs> they, they, they were having a sort of uh, a, a meeting with my other family members and there were pictures of them on the group crying. And I think that was just uh, for me, just huge. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. Now you uh, obviously that said, now, what are you thinking when you come back the next day in the final, you know, and uh, you, you, you open up again with 2085 on the final and how did, and then, you know, it wasn't until the final, obviously like the final, you know, three throws that you go 2140 and 2141. You know, you had two 2140s, which was better than Romani. He, he, he hit a 2188 on that first throw. Yeah. And, you know, that, that held him for fourth. But, I mean, at this point, you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Darlin Romani. I mean, Darlin Romani is an, like a beast, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that guy is huge, right? Like, you've competed against him. I, at, the guy is just traps, chest. I mean, <laughs> he is just giant. Like a bull. Um, yeah, like 
So what's it like, like, like what goes through your head at this point when you're there and it's like, you're punching it out with Romani. I mean, and all these guys, it's just like, um, and you know, at this point too, you're, you know, um, Walsh opened up at 2109. Right. And then he, of mm-hmm. course he, 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 he hit some better throws, but his, even to put in perspective, like his 2247 was the Olympic record before 2016. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like the, this, this was just like incredible competition. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going on and on, but <laughs> no, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. <laughs> so, so how do you, you know, you, you, you hit the 2085. Do you feel like, do you feel any pressure at that point? Do you feel like that's going to hold up to get you into the top eight so you can get three more? Or, you know, yeah, at, at that point, at that point, I definitely didn't think it was going to be enough to get me into uh, in top eight. So I was kind of still still chasing it. Um, but in the same breath, you know, realizing it's probably not going to be enough. I still have to be very active in, in, in trying, but also being relaxed enough so you don't mess up the timing and the throw. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was, a, I was a bit disappointed. I was a bit worried, um, obviously, after my third throw. And uh, it wasn't, you know, I thought all oh, 2085 because I, I don't know if that would have qualified for the final 2085. I don't know. what. You know, was. from what I what I see from looking at the results, I think that mm-hmm. that did put you in eighth. Right. OK, so, I think. Oh, sorry. You know, ex- exactly. So I was I th- yeah. think I was probably I was the last to qualify into that final. I remember. Um, and then. Uh, the South African Carl Bluchner threw 21 in his third throw, and that was when I was like, I, "This can't happen," you know. So <laughs> that that fired me up, and I re- I remember um, I remember saying to him because so I'm not a big coffee drinker, and obviously the Italians don't like that about me. But I now I've got into the habit of having um, like a triple espresso before the before I throw it. Kind of it it, it works yeah. really well because I'm not like used to the caffeine and whatnot. And so anyway, so I've been doing that. And then, of course, the morning of the Olympic final was the only time ever in a competition where there has not been coffee. They were running late. And I remember thinking to myself, I remember thinking, that's good. You know, of course, it will happen today. I thought, like, you know, you're going to do it without it. And I remember thinking that and going in and I thought, I'm not going to let this affect me. And uh, anyway, and then I remember off that third throw when, when Carl uh, threw 21, he said to me, he's like, do you want a Red Bull? So I was like, no. I was like, do you have a coffee? And he's like, I do have a coffee. So he pulls out this coffee and, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we share that in between the, the, the next three throws. And that was kind of, you know, I don't know if I can attribute it solely to the coffee, but um, it definitely put me in a good focus spot. And uh, it kind of took off from there. And I think that's one of the things that I also love the most about that Olympic final was to do it with Kyle, not that he's South African, but, you know, this young really good thrower yeah but like you know we were two i remember i trained with him for two months when i was in Joburg with the other coach he trains with my previous coach mm. with these two guys that everyone you know no one spoke about us leading into the games and you know here we are in the olympic final definitely top eight you know sharing a coffee before the final three throws and just thinking like we are just two guys out here having fun and uh, i think that that for me was such a beautiful moment of of the the competition and it helped keep me calm because i felt like you know we had another training session um, and have fun with it and that really that, that helped me a lot that's awesome um, but uh, yeah, sorry so I don't know I, I don't know if I answered your question I'm also getting a bit sidetracked <laughs> no 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 that's great it's love I love it it's cool it's cool insights for sure but yeah you know so when you go in you hit the PRs and I mean you're just thinking okay you made it in eighth and now yeah. you're thinking all right what do you what's where's your mindset oh, Are you right. just and what is coach Paolo what's he saying to you so I remember specifically, he said it to me after the 2086 in the, in the qualifications and also the 2080 um, uh, and, and also going into the, the fourth round. What I do when I come out the back of the circle, um, the arm, I don't keep the arm sort of level. Um, and so when I dip at the hip, the arm goes up. So he said to me, he said, keep your arm level coming out the back. And so that is the only thing I was thinking in that fourth throw. And then when I went 29, 40, I thought, oh, I thought that felt good. Um, and then again, then do, going after it again, I focused on the same thing and hit the 2141. And then in the sixth throw, I remember thinking it's all or nothing. And um, I pushed super hard, but I messed up the timing. And I think if I'd, if I'd kept the timing with the speed that I came out of the back of the circle with, um, it could have been something, could have been something special. No, that's awesome. And, uh, but it was, yeah, it was, it was perfect. I, you know, I couldn't be upset. <laughs> I couldn't yeah. be upset. No, that's, that's amazing. Again, you just kind of kept the peak going after that, right? You were just on a real hot streak. And I think you won the Italian club championship and finished with another PR. Like you had two more big PRs, a 2163 and then a 2166. 
you're like, exactly. a, you know, a consistent 70 foot guy at this point. That is a long ways from just a few years ago where you're barely throw you throw 19 meters one time. Yeah. Um, so, so this being said, you know, the, the American, I think partly why I think America is so good in the shot is because these guys are just freaks. They're, they're all Peyton Otterdahl. He's a monster. The guy's strong mm -hmm. as can be Krauser's yeah. a big, fast, really strong guy. Like he's incredible. Mm -hmm. Joe Ko did you see Joe Kovacs with last year? They made it on, he had like an 870 squat for four. I mean, it's Crazy. just like, he's literally got to be one of the strongest dudes on the planet. Like, I mean, Agreed. he's, he, he's an, he's incredible. So yeah. that being said, what are your strength levels? Everybody wants to know this stuff. Everybody yeah, wants yeah. to know what do you bench? What do you squat? Like <laughs> where, where are you? Um, it's, yeah, so I, I can't enjoy sharing these numbers because it's, uh, I think it speaks to the beauty of technique. Um, prior to the Olympic Games, my PR was 150 kgs for two in the bench press. Wow. Um, but now, so now I've gone up to 160 kgs for two. <laughs> um, I have done in the squat, I haven't gone over 200 for two. Uh, we only kind of do uh, quarter squats as well. So I haven't gone over 200. Okay. Um, and then snatch um i've only gone up to 90 kgs for wow. three a 90 and, kilo snatch for three yeah and you can throw 70 feet in the shot this is unbelievable man <laughs> um i'm just trying to think those are kind of the big markers we don't deadlift um, okay clean squat do you do jerks uh we do a behind the neck jerk um but it's kind of it's not it's not a joke you, you don't we don't use our legs it's more just we stand on our toes just to get that that rhythm um mm. and i've gone up to 100 100 kgs on that mm. behind the okay, neck so, kind of jerk yeah all right um, but but those are kind of the only ones that i can think that are of any interest especially for the big the big uh, sort of three so so what now you i heard you earlier say you throw one day it sounds like you lift one day mm. and you do a circuit so that was that was specifically during COVID because obviously we had no like access oh, to physiotherapists okay. and whatnot. Gotcha, um, gotcha. And at, in, in that period, I think the heaviest I went on the bench was 115, which is just crazy. Wow. Yes. Uh, but at, at, at but at that time, I hadn't had really consistent weight training, so it was like for me it was still a bit of a, a hassle. Okay. But um, anyway, but that was yeah, you know, that was then. And um, but now, so it, it depends on what part of the season we're in. But we kind of do like a when we're on a training camp, we'll do a two one two uh two one two one one two one um, two one one what is that so so we'll do uh throws weightlifting on a monday uh okay. throws throws on a tuesday um throws and weightlift uh we'll do field work and weightlifting on a wednesday okay so what's field work field work so we'll go down to like obviously a, a stadium we'll do some 60 meter like rhythmic runs we'll do some hurdle work um, overhead throws, front throws, um, jumps into the sand pit. Uh, so it's kind of like it's an active recovery because my coach doesn't like to put three throwing days together. Hmm. Um, yeah. Especially because, especially you know, it's on on a training camp, it's quite it's quite intense. It's you know, we've just finished one now, and it's you kind of walk out and you think, flip. Well, that's been like that's been a month, and you and I don't know where it's gone. <laughs> it's 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 crazy. You know, I, I nap between the sessions. You wake up, you eat, you, and you're on to the next one. You know, and then you have supper. You go back home, you right. sleep, and you do it again the next day. So it's really busy. So that's kind of so that's you know Wednesday is is, is field work, weightlifting in the afternoon. Um, Friday, Thursday is just wait, uh, just the throws in the morning. Okay. Friday is throw in the morning, uh, weightlifting afternoon. And then Saturday's weightlifting. Um, so that's kind of how it's set up for, for, our, for our training camps. And that is similar to last year, but a little bit different. There was a few tweaks. Um, uh, I can't remember. I must look at the programs. But it's, it's kind of, that's the principle that uh, my coach okay. kind of adopts. And then how, how um, much rest do you do after a training camp? Is it like a download week? Do you completely leave everything off? Is it everything lighter? Like, how does that look? So we'll do a three a three week uh, like I've just described to you now, and then our fourth week of that training camp will be uh, th just throws Monday, throws Tuesday, field work on a Wednesday, um, and then also like throws on a Thursday and Friday, and then like a lot weightlifting. So it's kind of less weightlifting, mm -hmm. um, considerably, and then fewer throws, maybe 
between five and ten fewer throws. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of how it's working now. That's what we just finished, um, and I think that's you were saying something earlier that I wanted to touch on. You're saying about peaking for the games and then doing really well at the end of the season. Um, you know, we, we we're still experimenting. Um, I don't really have too much uh, to to compare it to. I've got two years, and they've kind of been different for many for many reasons. Right. So we're still experimenting. We're still trying to find. I definitely think. Man, I, I really wanted to go on for another month after my last competition. I was in really good shape. Training was incredible. I was, you know, shocked to see the shape I was in. Um, I had some nice big fouls at the uh, at the Diamond League final, uh, you know, at training, in competition warm-ups. So I wanted to try, you know, get that into a competition. But obviously, that was kind of the last one. And it was important for me to rest, especially if I wanted to main, uh, be mentally focused going into the season. Right. Um, but it definitely seems like towards the end of the year, I, I get into really good shape because similarly, I threw 2070 um, right at the end of my of my year uh, in the previous year. So it mm -hmm. definitely seems I'm, I'm in good shape towards the end of the year. Very cool. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the fitness stuff, um, you know, just sounds just kind of what you're explaining. And, and, and when you're lifting, um, you know, I feel like the, the trap a lot of people will fall into is like, they got to push strength strengths. It's a keyboard. It's a strength sport. So what do you think? I mean, clearly based on what you just explained number wise, you look like you still have a lot of upside. So where, yeah. where do you think kind of leading that as we'll kind of start, I'll start wrapping it up, to, you know, cause I appreciate your time and I don't want to keep, keep you Thank on you. all day, but uh, you know, where does, what is the outlook to you? Like, what's kind of the, where do you, you know, 22, I'm sure is, is probably got to be one of the big, big goals, I would think, right? That's a big yeah. milestone. I think you threw against uh, Josh Awatunde, right? Another stud from America. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, and he hit, you guys had a nice battle at that one of the meets where you went 2163, right? It depends who you ask. He thinks it's a nice battle. For me, it was just a battle. <laughs> no, Fair enough. Easy. Yeah. No. And, but another, you know, he, super nice guy, you know. Um, yeah. And uh, no, I was really happy for him that meet. Um, you know, I was, I was still uh, a bit frustrated because that was 2166 was a slip from the hand. So I was kind of like, when I said it, I was like, I just want to get in, you know, and, and throw again. But obviously, it was the last throw. Yeah. But um, when, when, when he hit 22, man, it's, it's just, it's so nice to see guys that are just like down to earth and doing the sport for the love of the sport. It's easy to get caught up in the like sponsorship deals and and, and whatever. Uh, it's actually not so easy, but you know, you can get caught up in the sponsorship deals and you know, the money and the fame and all this stuff. But you know, to see guys that are just like out there doing what they can to train hard. Uh, they love the sports, you know, they, they're growing themselves. Um, I'll, I'll never not celebrate another guy, uh, you know, doing well like that. It's incredible. And it was, it was awesome to share that with him because we, we had a competition in uh, Rovereto the week before. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously he had, he had been there for two, he had landed two days before that competition, dealing with jet lag and whatever, competed there. Um, so to see him come back and respond so well in that next competition was right. awesome. And, and I'm so happy for him to, to have done that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, you saw the U S uh, Olympic trials, right? You had, Otterdahl, Josh, and you had Darrell Hill, and they were all within like four centimeters. Like it was like two centimeters Two, I mean, it, it, you know, and they all threw like 21, what it was like 21, 98, 96 and 94 or something like. Brilliant. Yeah. And yeah, you, you know, it, it, it just, the, the U S shot put is crazy, but uh, is. any rate, but the point was with <laughs> uh, you, um, you've you look like you can get a lot stronger you've really only been two years you know i think i saw a really nice post you had made on like facebook or something you were like 17 months prior this guy was a stranger and you were talking about you know paulo and you and how much you guys have achieved and that and you know it's obviously uh it worked incredibly well you do, how often do you train with uh fabrio uh, pretty much every time we train. Okay. So we train we train quite a quite a bit together, yeah. Um and he's got a what a 2199 PR, isn't that his PR? 2199, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um that's gotta be like how much does that push you to having a guy like that every day? And then, you know, how how was it between you two where you jumped up and he didn't probably yeah, I'm sure he was expecting to perform a little bit 
you know, throw a little further than he did. Cause he had some really great marks last year. And, yep. uh, and, and then, you know, how is that when in the training environment with you two, like how's Yo, the, the, like the, the, the group uh, dynamic. Yeah. 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 So, um, it, of, of course, you know, I'm very thankful that, uh, he, he allowed me to train with him in the beginning. You know, he took me into his home for a month as well. Um, he, he helped me, he helped me a lot and it was just, you know, it's such an honor to be, um, in the early stages of someone throwing like that and realize, you know, you're just a human being that can throw really far. Um, you know, you, you tend to put these guys on a pedestal. So to be involved in the intimate daily happenings of someone that's such a good thrower, um, gave me a lot of motivation, gave me a lot of comfort and a lot of patience for, for myself. And, you know, just to, to be seeing a good technique continually while you're training and being able to watch and, 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 um, uh, learn from him was, was incredible. And, uh, so that, that, that's huge. And, um, in obviously since that, um, since I've sort of, you know, I had a really good towards the end of the year and his marks weren't as good. He's been, um, dealing with some, you know, discomfort, uh, muscular wise. And, um, I think, you know, after COVID, it sort of, uh, it uh, kind of like took away some of the sensibility of his timing and whatnot for, mm. I'm not too sure how, how or why, but, you know, he, he kind of, struggled to find his rhythm again, but had a beautiful 21-71 in uh, the Diamond League in his hometown. That was, you know, to, that's kind of what I, what I say, like, you know, of course there's competition, but, you know, to be involved, like with Josh, when he threw 22, uh, Fabri, when he threw 21-71 in, 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 the, in the town that he grew up in at the stadium he was competing at, you know, to be a part of those things for me is just, it's so motivating. It's so beautiful to be a part of, um, you know, I see what it requires to be a thrower. So I can never... I, I can never, you know, look at someone's uh, great result and, and be frustrated because of my own performance, you know. So to be involved, that gives me such motivation um, uh, to be a part of those sorts of things. And so I think now, you know, that helped me. He's helped me so much to be, you know, proud and uh, to see how he interacts with the Italians and, you know, the Italian culture. And I'm learning a lot from him always. And, uh, you know, he's been very supportive of um of me and in, in my success, you know, and so I think managing the team cohesion and team dynamic is an important part, but we've managed uh, so far to, to keep it, uh, you know, reasonably good and keep it in an environment where everyone's still learning and supportive of each other. So, um, you know, a lot of people have asked that because I think it's a natural question. It's so easy to kind of, uh, you know, let the jealousy creep in, but uh, we've, you know, we've managed to keep it at bay. So, so far, so good. And um, may, long may it continue. No, that's awesome. Okay. So listen, I, I appreciate it. We've been talking for a while and uh, I, I, I'm loving it. I'm going to give you a couple, just a couple of quick rapid questions. Day in the life of Zane Weir. What's it like? Uh, wake up, eat, train, uh, eat, nap, train, nap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see your favorite movie. The accountant. The accountant. Oh, okay, very cool. Um, favorite book. Yo, there, there's a few. I'm going to go with one that's actually a South African writer. It's called Textures of Silence by Gordon Foster. Okay, very cool. Mm -hmm. See uh, that 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 right there just tells me you're you're a good intellectual kind of guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't be fooled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's see favorite food i'm not a fussy eater but i do enjoy a good burger okay yeah something about a good burger um chicken wings or tacos chicken wings chicken wings okay i'm a taco guy i can eat tacos every day. <laughs> I, won't, I won't hold it against you <laughs> no, um, it's, a, it's not as popular in, in, in south africa i, I figured in right the US. Mm. yeah tacos and, and i'm half mexican so my it's like okay. it's like you genetically in me to want tacos yeah. every day. <laughs> so. that's not such a bad thing there's worse <laughs> there's worse habits <laughs> yeah so um let's see and final let's uh favorite relaxing activity to do spend time with the people i love my girlfriend my family probably probably my favorite very cool does your girlfriend mm. you have an italian girlfriend or a girl from south africa no, South African girlfriend. Okay. Um, so we are we uh, slogging through long distance. <laughs> oh, that's a trick. Yeah. All right. Favorite song. Favorite song. That's a mm. tough one. That's a broad question. It is a tough one. I'm going to pick one, but it's not necessarily, you know, I've got so many favorites, um, but I would go Tim Shell by Mumford and Sons. Okay. And then what, how about your favorite pump up song? 
you have a pump up song pump you're gonna get song. you're like gonna get jacked up for uh i'm old so like i used to like, listen, like black sabbath back in the day for me yeah, which, yeah, yeah. which was old and classic when i was competing of you course know. there um there's a there's an, a u.s artist russ um i remember on the way in the olympics i was listening a lot to him um <laughs> there's a song i think it's called me versus you oh yeah uh, I like that yeah, one. I very cool. That. See, there yeah. you go again with some philosophy <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, what's the, what's the kind of, what's the big goal you think? Uh, and you don't have to share that if you don't want it or anyway, but what do you, what are you hoping to do in the next couple of years in Paris is only, you know, three years away. Right. Which is yes, kind of cool. Yeah. So I'm imagining, you know, Paris has got to be uh, a big goal. I would imagine uh of course so what's uh how how far knowing that walsh threw 21 38 in 2016 at the olympics and then the next year i think he's when he threw 22 and then he threw 20 20 22 91 in doha a few years later knowing how strong you are and he's kind of on that vibe too where he wasn't i think he was stronger than you though <laughs> so <laughs> I you think know, so. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, but you know, he's obviously gotten bigger and stronger. There was a great picture I think him and Kovacs put up together, where like when they were competing with back in like thirteen or fourteen, and then like five years later, they're both just like so much bigger, and you know, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so how what do you think you ultimately? Where do you think you can fall? What kind of you know performance was like from a yeah. distance perspective, or just overall from a distance perspective. I'm assuming you're hunting for an Olympic medal. That's a given, right? You're fifth. I got to think you're thinking, yeah, look at, I'm a, I'm a, I'm 250 pounds. I can compete with these guys. I'm going to win a medal. So I, I have to believe that's where your mindset's at. Of course. And, and uh, so it definitely is, I mean, an Olympic medal would be, would mean a lot, but uh, you know, and it is only one mark of my success. I think right. distance wise, it's so, it's so difficult because I really actually don't care um of course you want it as far as possible do you know right, what i mean right. um but uh i don't know I, i'd love an olympic medal i'd love a world champs medal i'd love all these sort of accolades but i think you know uh, when, when i think about it i don't want to sound uh, you know wishy-washy and whatnot but it really is i just want to stay um in love with my in love with my daily practice i think that for me i think is the most important if i can um make a living doing uh, something that's meaningful to me um and of course i'd love to you know i'd love for my hard work to to, to pay off and then get olympic gold and world championship gold but i think yeah know, to um to continue using the sport to to make me interact better with other people i think that would probably be my biggest goal of, of the sport otherwise you know I, I need to pick something else that's a little bit more fulfilling but, right um as far as far as possible um i hope 22 meters will will, will come soon but um it's a beautiful thing about the sport the the harder you grip it the the, the quicker it falls so um <laughs> i think uh yeah just to enjoy the daily practice make sure it's making me better and uh, i think that that's my ultimate goal for for my career awesome man well hey uh i just want to say thank you so much for doing this and uh like i said it, there was uh it's pretty incredible it was uh like i said not just a and again, not just a fifth place performance at the Olympics, <laughs> right? It's like, that's amazing. But at the best Olympic shot put final in history, I mean, that that's just like I said, you would have won. It's got to be a pretty cool feeling to know, you know, this throw, I would have won like multiple Olympics, right? Like I would have medaled in almost every single Olympics, you know, like that. So that really puts in perspective. So, and I think it's just more impressive, like how you've done it how you, like I said, the, the jumps you've made in the last few years, um, your strength levels. I mean, like it, it just really going to be exciting to see you uh, continue to throw over the next few years. I look forward to hopefully meeting you in person. I, I, I want to come visit you in Italy now. You know, I want to hang out with you guys. Beautiful. That'd be, that'd yeah. be fantastic. So, it, yeah. um, but uh, thank you again. Uh, congratulations again. And um, uh yeah, it was absolutely fantastic hanging out with you and getting to talk with you. So awesome. No, thank you for having me. And I appreciate your, you know, your insight, the research you've done for the interview, your passion about the sport. I mean, I think it's guys like you um, or people like you that, that uh, keep the sport interesting. And, um, yeah, you know, I think 
the you know coming fifth at, at one of the best Olympics of all time is is fantastic. But I think you know what sport does for the young mind, I think is is way more important than 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 any Olympic medal. So thank you for for you and, and the coaches um, like yourself that are out there. I think it's super super important, and it's yeah. I, uh, I I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me on. Hey, thank you so much. All right, man. Can I, well, can I, sorry, can I interrupt you? Can I tell you one one quick crazy story? Considering you know Dane. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'd like him to reach out for me, or maybe you can chat to him. I'd like to just have a word. But um, in university, I can't remember the year. It might have been I don't know if it was 2018 or 2017. I reached out to him looking for help on his on his on his page, and I said, you know, listen. I'm looking for some advice just in, in, in the weight training um, facility just to kind of get a basic program. I've got no idea. Okay. And uh, anyway, he came out and he's like, yeah, of course, you know, have a look on my page, you know, and it was like a hundred dollars. And I said, listen, Dane, um, you know, I don't want to do any disservice to your business and, you know, who you are and whatnot, but, you know, is it possible to do cheap? I cannot afford that. Um, and he, he, he helped me out and um, I responded when I qualified for the Olympics, I actually messaged him and I voice noted him and he read it, but I don't know if he actually listened because he probably gets stars. And I don't even know if he answers his own messages. Um, but uh, I wanted to give him that extra $50 and I think I'll maybe wait till hopefully I see him in, in Oregon this year and, uh, cause, and and meet him, shake his hand and uh, and acknowledge him because he, he definitely helped me at university with the weight training um, to get to the 1909 that kind of put me on an interesting recognition radar for the Italian guys. So um, if you can just tell him that story, sure, sure. Um, I'd, re- I'd greatly appreciate it. And then obviously to meet him in America, God willing, um, would be would be awesome. I'd love I'd love to love to shake his hand and, and say thank you and give him his fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Just so you know, Dean copies everything I do. <laughs> oh really? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I won't give him an interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, no. we're we're friends. We hang out every year at the U.S. Championships and that kind of stuff. Awesome. But but he's even self admitted. He's like, I've watched every single video you've put up, like every one of them. And I'm like, oh, he wow. would. <laughs> To the point, I should, probably shouldn't even say what I'm about to say, but I, ha- I, ha- I had an editor that I trained for three years that broke his contract and is editing for Dane now. No, <laughs> a trader. It just, it, so, so he, and I, and we talked about it this year and he goes, I probably should have told you, shouldn't I? And I was like, like you know, probably- I'm like, it, yeah, I'm like, you know, the guys, I, I won't say anything, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a very cool situation, but uh, no. so, so at any rate. But oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, maybe cut so the he, part out there. Don't you can, you <laughs> can, you can, you can buy Dana beer. That's what I'll tell you. You don't need to give Perfect. him his 50 bucks. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, awesome. No, no, but I look forward to meeting you, man. And again, please, uh, not please, but thank you for your time. It's, um, it's, it's fantastic to be able to speak about, you know, what I'm passionate about on this platform and have someone that's interested in the sport, knows the statistics um, and gives it context. It's love. I, I really appreciate hearing you put things into context, like the fit of the games, because, you know, obviously I feel these things, but I'm very biased. Um, <laughs> and I think hearing it from someone that knows what they're talking about, passionate about the sport, just is extremely motivating for me and extremely humbling. So thank you very much. Hey, you're very welcome, man. It was a total pleasure. And uh, like I said, I look forward to, hopefully I'll be up there in Oregon as well, get to meet you. We'll go to dinner or something. And uh, like I said, I'd love to come to Italy, though, and get some good Italian food and hang out. That would be fantastic. Yeah, so. no, but we look forward to having you. man. so if you, if you do ever come down, let me know and we can we can certainly arrange something. Sounds fantastic. All fantastic. right, man. Thanks for your patience and good luck going forward. Uh, yeah, I hope everything goes well and works in your favor. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, take, take care. care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.